Cars, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars. Broadcast 205 regarding a murder in Leona Canyon. No information available as to suspects in this case. That's all. Rosenquist. Today, more than ever before, the American consumer is asserting his buying power, individually and collectively. He is beginning to buy on recommendations from reliable sources. He analyzes the sales stories on gasoline, for example, and discards the weak need generalities claimed for many brands. He wants to know who are the best authorities on gasoline, who are its largest users, and he must know whether their use of that product is the same as his. There is no other testing ground to compare with the 55 million miles driven by emergency equipment that exclusively uses Rio Grande cracked gasoline. That's driving like you do, only harder. It's starting, stopping, slow, long miles of economical cruising, acceleration, pickup, speeding. It's everything you expect from a car and a gasoline. Over 30 of your cities and counties have selected Rio Grande cracked gasoline over all other brands. More police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment use Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. Rio Grande sales show that motorists have accepted Rio Grande's invitation to buy as the strongest, most sincere, and convincing proof of a superior gasoline. Police car performance with Rio Grande cracked is an established fact. Get it in your car at your Rio Grande dealers tomorrow. We are happy to have present again at a Calling All Cars broadcast a representative from the Sheriff's Office of Los Angeles County, under whose jurisdiction tonight's case was solved. We present Captain A.C. Jewell. Occasionally a crime is committed that proves most baffling to officers assigned to investigate it. Such is the case you are to hear tonight. With the most meager clues which to work, the officers who solved this case prepared such a complete file of evidence that both defendants were caught and brought to trial in record time. We are proud of the efficiency of our department and of the work which the men of the sheriff's office do. We are glad to be a part of the vast machinery that makes it its business to see that criminals are brought to justice and are made to see that crime does not pay. In a little house in Leona Canyon, two men stand staring at the body of a man. Five minutes before he had been alive, now his lifeblood staining the white scrubbed floor, he lay dead, murdered. You killed him. Shut up, you fool. What are we going to do? Get him out of here. No, no, I won't touch him. You want a dose of this yourself? <laughs> Come on, take his head. <laughs> Bloody. What do you expect? You didn't say you was going to kill him. Ah, stop squawking. Get hold of him. Put some steam in it, stupid. Do a little work yourself. Why are you spilling the money out of his pocket? <laughs> well, pick it up. Hey, we'll get it later. Come on, let's pitch him in a well. On the morning of May 18th, Lieutenant Farmer Juan Eratucho and a companion make their way along the winding road leading to the cabin of Theodore Wallman. I hear old man Wallman had a little trouble with Daniels. Oh, see, si, this McDaniels, he always pass over Wallman's land when he go to his rancho. How else could he get there? Quien sabe. Just the same, abuelo no like it. How come you always call the old man abuelo? Oh, he's a fine old man. He like father to me. But I told to be a son, so I call him grandfather. What does he say to that? Oh, he laughs. <laughs> I don't see the old man around anywhere. Oh, he sit by the fire on chilly mornings. He ought to be out and around by this time, though. 
Maybe, I think so. We're going to see, eh? Huh? Ah, pero misericordioso. Mother of saints. What, what has happened? There's been a man killed in here. Sangre de mi madre. Mr. Wallman. Oh, Mr. Wallman. He, he's not here. Where could he be? He's bound to be here somewhere. Look, look, somebody's dragged something through the yard. Yes, it, it leads toward the well. Let's look. There, there's blood on the ground. And on the side of the well. We'll have to move these boxes. Maybe they hid him in there. <gasps> Dios mío. Well, that, that's old man Wallman down there. Uh, he, he's dead. Let's go get the constable. No, we better call the sheriff. All right, but let's do it. Who found the body? I, senor. Uh, we found it, senor McPhillips and myself. Uh, we got it out of the well. Did you touch anything? Only the body, senor. Well, we might as well go inside. See. Si. Who was the man? His name was Wallman. Have any enemies? Oh, si, senor. Many, I think. Who in particular? Only one I know for sure is McDaniels. Well, who is McDaniels? Uh, he's a fellow who owned the land on the other side of this rancho. Ever have any trouble with Wallman? Oh, si, si, many times. What about? Well, at least uh, Daniels or McDaniels... Always he have to go across uh, Senor Walmer's rancho to get to his house. That caused the trouble. I see. Trespass, huh? See? Si. Well, where does this uh, McDaniels live? Oh, he no live. He died last month. Oh, for the love of Mike. Say, what's the idea of telling me all this about him having trouble with the old man, then? Well, it's, uh, Daniel, uh, he have a wife. Also, he have brother-in-law. Are they dead, too? Oh, no, senor. They live in Los Angeles. Well, just how did this Daniels happen to fight with the old man? Well, senor, one day, this Daniels, he come to the rancho and he start across the, the road. And, uh, senor Wallman, he said, Hey, you, get off my property. Oh, what's eating you, you old fossil? Who's bothering your property anyhow? Can't hurt none to walk across it. Look here, young fella. Don't you get tough with me or I'll have the law on you. I've had enough of this. I'm getting fed up with your griping about trespass every time I have to walk across your gold blame old cow pasture. Now go on, get the law. Get half a dozen laws if you want to. I'm going to walk through here when I get gosh darn good and ready. Over my dead body you are, by granny. Maybe that can be arranged, too. Oh, so you're threatening me now, are you? Sure I'm threatening you, you persimmon-eating old toad. You've been threatening me ever since I've been living here. I'm getting fed up with it. I'm warning you. The next time you make a crack at me, you'd better be prepared to back it up. I'm prepared to back it up right now. Then you better start doing it. Come down off that porch and square up. <laughs> Wait, you, you old fool, start a fight. Take that. You, hey, you're hey, too old. Hey, abuelo, hey, what's the matter here? Senor Daniels, what you do? Ah, this old fogey started a row again about my passing through his land. Uh, turn right, I did. I mean it, too. You keep off my property. Oh, abuelo, abuelo. Don't, don't get excited. Senor Daniels, he me no harm Just to you. Just the same. I don't want him around here. Now get you. All right. I'm going. But I'll be back. When I do, I'll settle with you once and for all. I'm ready for you any time. No, sheep no, 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 wait. Wait a minute, abuelo. Remember, Senor Daniels, he have a weak heart. I'll say he has. And it's yellow besides. I'll teach him a lesson. That's the last time Senor Daniels was over here. Well, I'll make a note of that. Anybody else around here who had trouble with him? Oh, lots of people, Senor. He had many enemies. You know any of them? Well, there is his son, the oldest one. He has a deed to this place. Maybe Where he... Where is he? He operates a rancho. Okay, I'll see about him later. Anybody else? Well, he has a nephew who lived down in the valley. The nephew owed him lots of money. That's so? See? Si. Well, I'll look this place over. Go out and tell those two deputies I want to see them, will you? Si, senor. Want to see us, chief? Yes, what have you found out? Seems the old man used to sell cigars and cigarettes and farm produce to the neighbors. Had a little trouble with a fellow named McDaniels. I know about that. What else? Yeah, we've checked up on most of his neighbors, and he seemed to have a lot of trouble with most of them. Well, that makes it complicated, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Well, Hunter, you better stick around here and help me. And be you go out and pick up the son and the nephew for questioning. Check with the coroner on the condition of the body and come back here when you get through. Okay, Chief. Where'd you get that silver dollar, Chief? Hmm? Oh, oh, I, I picked it up here on the floor. Oh, by the way, Hanby, yeah? you better take this with you and get a re- report on it. There's a bloody thumbprint on here. It might prove valuable. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, Hunter, let's see what we can find. Here's a baby that did the work. Steel drill, huh? Yeah. A couple of socks with that would finish almost any man. Looks like the killer came back and cleaned the place up. Cleaned it out, it'd be better. Looking for money, apparently. He sure did a good job of ransacking the place. Well, it looks like the old man was sitting here getting ready to eat when the murderer hit him. There's enough blood around here. I'll see. And you better get some scrapings. May need them for comparisons later. Yeah, here's a scrap of paper. Looks like it is torn off from a larger piece. Let's see that. Probably part of a wad used to scrub up the blood. Hmm, queer wrinkles in it, huh? Yeah, I wonder what they were used for. Hunter, I've got it. What? Why, this piece of paper may be the answer to this case. How? Never mind, but I'll bet my bottom dollar that the killer wears glasses. (laughs) That makes it simple. Simpler than you think. There couldn't have been many persons acquainted with Wallman's habits well enough to know or believe that he had a lot of money. Assuming that the motive was robbery. Well, that should be obvious from the way this place is torn up. Anyway, it ought to be easy to find out how many of his neighbors wore glasses. What makes you think it's a neighbor? Whoever did this was familiar with Wallman's habits and with the place. This was a well-planned murder. The officers made a thorough search of the house without uncovering further clues of value. Late that night, Wright, Hunter, and Hanby meet for a conference. Well, what did you boys find out? Uh, It looks like a murder for revenge to me. Uh, The old man was killed with that drill, apparently. Struck three times. I checked all of McDaniel's relatives, and none of them wear glasses. The undertaker told me he saw two men in a Ford truck headed toward the ranch. Yeah? He passed them as he was taking the body into Lancaster. They uh, slowed down and looked back, and... One of them had on glasses. Did he know either of them? No, but I checked up with some of the people living around here, and there have been two men seen in the canyon from time to time who answered those descriptions. Anybody know who they are? One of them is a partner of this fellow McDaniels, the one who dropped dead last month just after he had that trouble with Warman, you know. I see. Well, who is the other one? McDaniels' brother-in-law. Uh-huh. Now we're getting somewhere. I checked on the McDaniel story. It's apparently another of many rows the old man had with the uh, people who crossed his land. He wouldn't let them build a road through his property and was always kicking about trespass and things like that. Did uh, Wallman have enough trouble with anybody to make them sore enough to do this job? I don't think so. What it looks like to me is that these two young fellows decided the old man had a little money and made up their minds to get it, that's all. Yeah, that's the way it looks to me, too. Assuming that they were are the ones who did the job. Well, I'm going back out there in the morning and look the place over again. You better mm-hmm. stick around and check up on those fingerprints we picked up. Okay. Deputy Bright drove to the ranch, musing as he drove. Now, this might be robbery. It might be revenge. Oh, but you can't pick up a guy just because he wears glasses. I've got one clear thumbprint. He had enemies. No money. May have been trying to make him tell where the money was. I got a hunch they'll come back. Bright drove on to the ranch, and as he drove into the Woolman yard, he saw two women wandering about the place. He parked, and the women approached. Senor, have you seen Mr. Adams? Why, no. Who's Mr. Adams? Oh, he lives here. We just drove out from the town to get the furniture. Furniture? See. Si. Oh, yes, yes, the furniture, sure. We thought we'd better come out and look at it first before we bought it. He said it belonged to a relative of his. Uh, an uncle, I think it was. Are you sure this is the right place? Oh, sure, senor. We saw the name on the mailbox. It was the name that he told to us. What name was it? Mr. Wallman. That was him. Did Adam say he'd be out today? Si, si, senor. He said that he would be out to stack the furniture this evening. But still, we thought we'd look at it first. After all, we don't want to buy a pig in the sack. No, that wouldn't be a very good idea. I don't like to wait him here much longer, though. Well, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. 
I'll be around here for a while. Mr. Adams shows up, I'll tell him that you were here. I will give you my name and address, senor. And you can give it to him if he comes while you are here. That'll be fine. Just write on this card, will you? Gracias, senor. Victoria Gonzalez Street, Los Angeles. Uh, there you are. This is Victoria Gonzalez, Utah Street, Los Angeles. Well, Mrs. Gonzalez, I'll be here for some time. Mr. Adams comes, I'll give him your message. Gracias again, senor. Leaning over the door of the woman's truck before it had gotten underway, Bright ascertained that the address she had given him was authentic. He copied the license number of the truck. Then as she drove away, the deputy drove his own car into the now empty garage and waited. An hour passed. Then, through a crack in the garage door, Bright saw a car approach. Slow down. Then continue slowly past the woman place. Farther up the road, it turned around and came back. Swung into the yard and with motor running, came to a stop. Two men sat in the car. Both were young, dark, and one wore shell-rimmed glasses. Bright saw them gaze suspiciously at the fresh tracks his car had made when he drove it into Woolman's garage. Their black eyes bored piercingly into the gloom where the officer waited. One man turned and whispered to his companion. With a cry of complaining gears, the car got underway, shot into the road, and gained speed. Bright swung open the garage door and dashed gun in hand after the fleeing pair. Hey, stop! Stop! Ah, nuts. Well, that'll hold them for a while. Okay, monkeys. Stay where you are. Hey, you come back here. All right, come on. I'll take you in anyway. We'll get your buddy later. What is it, senor? What are you arresting me for? Suspicion of murder at the moment. We'll find some more charges later. Oh, no, 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 no senor. I didn't do it. Willie, he Who's was... Who's Willie? Well, he's the man who ran away. He did it. Oh, yeah? Well, we'll find out about that. I didn't do it. He did it. What's your name? Alfonso Rincon. Who's the other fellow? Willie Adams. Okay, Rincon. I'll just handcuff you to the car till I can get to a telephone. Then we'll pick up Mr. Adams. Within half an hour, a posse of deputy sheriffs from the precinct station, augmented by neighbors armed with shotguns, clubs, or rifles, had taken the trail of the fugitive. At dusk, they found him cowering in a box canyon, arms taut above his head as the posse approached. Adams and Rincon were taken to headquarters for questioning. What's your full name? Willie Adams. Sure it isn't William Granado? Sometimes. You know a man named Wallman? Yeah. How long have you known him? Mm, two years, maybe two and a half. Ever have any trouble with him? No, I never had any trouble with him. Where do you live? On her ranch. By her, you mean Mrs. McDaniels here? Yeah. You know anything about her husband? Well, she told me he died. I don't know. You don't know whether he's dead? No, I don't. Did uh, Mr. McDaniels ever have any trouble with Warman? I think they had trouble. Same trouble all the time. Did you see Mrs. McDaniels on Sunday, the day that Warman died? Yeah, about one o'clock. Where? At the ranch. She was with that fellow, Vic Lund. Who else was with her? I don't know. Any other man? I don't know. Was uh, anybody up there with you? Alfonso, her brother, he was with me. How did Mrs. McDaniels get to the ranch? She drove up. Alone? Uh, that other fellow, Lund, he was with her. What was said to you by either of them? Mm. He said, don't say nothing about it. Just give me the money and keep quiet. Don't say nothing about any trouble. How did you happen to go to Wallman's place? Mm. Those fellows, uh, Alfonso and Lund, uh, and she... Uh, he wanted to talk to him, so we all went up there. Wallman, he wanted to say something. They didn't say nothing. They hit him over the head. They killed him. Who hit him? Alfonso. Then what did they do? He picked up the money and put, it, and put him in the well. Did you pick up any money? No. You didn't pick up this silver dollar? No. I never picked up anything. Oh. How much did you get? About six dollars, I think it was. And some pennies. Well, tell me, uh, then what did Alfonso do? He said, I'm going to give you some money. Don't say nothing about this business. Alfonso killed him. 
Well, uh, what did you do after you killed this man? I never killed him. They did. Oh, yes. You said that before, didn't you? Well, uh, what did they do with him? We put him in the well. We piled the boards and boxes up on it. What was Mrs. McDaniels doing all this time? Just watching from the auto down by the barn. Are you absolutely sure she was there? Oh, sure. Are you sure Lund was there? Sure, he was there. Are you absolutely sure Alfonso killed Waldman? Yes, sir. Alfonso killed him. Is this the picture of the man who killed Waldman? Yeah, that's Alfonso. He did it. Is Alfonso this woman's brother? Yeah. Did she tell you she wanted this man killed? Yes. How many times did Alfonso hit him? Three times. I think. You think? Amby, take Adams in the other room and bring in Lund. Okay. Come on, Adams. Lund. Captain Black wants to see you. Yeah, sure. Come in, Lund. Sit down. Thank you. Lund, do you know Alfonso Rincon? Yeah, a little bit. He worked around the paper office on Fridays and Saturdays and Saturday nights. Did you see him Saturday? No, I seen him uh, Sunday night, though. Where was this? Uh, at the home of his sister, Mrs. McDaniel. How did you happen to be there? Oh, I had just returned from uh, San Diego with her little boy. Uh, I took him down there with me on Saturday. And you weren't at the ranch Sunday? No, I was not at the ranch. Oh, Hanby. Yeah. Bring Adams back in here. Okay. Sit down, Adams. Mm. Now, when did you say you saw this man, Lund? I saw him Sunday at the ranch. Whereabouts on the ranch? In the kitchen of Wallman's house. Did he pick up the money that fell out of Wallman's pocket? Yes. Lund, where were you Sunday? I, I told you I was in San Diego visiting my brother-in-law. Where else did you go? Uh, we went over to Tijuana. I left San Diego about uh, 4.30 in the afternoon and uh, got back here about 9 or 9.30 Sunday night. Anybody with you? Yeah, Mrs. McDaniel's little boy, Robert. He was with me. Call him in, Henry. All right, Chief. Hey, come in a minute, will you, Robert? Sure. Robert, how old are you? Eleven. You go to school? Yes, sir. I'm in the A-5. A-5, huh? That's great. Robert, do you know this man, Lund? Sure. I went to San Diego with him Saturday. What time did you leave? Twenty minutes after twelve. How do you know? Well, he was supposed to be there at twelve fifteen. He was late, so I looked at the clock when he did come. What time did you get to San Diego? About five o'clock. How do you know that? There was a clock in the car. Did you stay in San Diego overnight? Yes, sir. I stayed at Mr. Lund's sister's house. Anybody else there? Sure. Mr. Lund and his sister's husband and Emmeline and Helen. Mr. Lund's their uncle. We had a party with cake and ice cream. What time did you leave? Sunday afternoon, about 4.30. And you got home when? About 9.30. You looked at the clock again, did you? Yes, sir. That's all, Robert. Thank you, sir. Mrs. McDaniels, you've been pretty quiet during all this. Suppose you tell us about this trip you made to the ranch. I didn't make any trip to the ranch. No? No. I spent Saturday afternoon at the hospital with my other boy. Mr. Lund had taken Robert to San Diego with him. When I got home, my brother was gone. He had told me that this Adams here wanted him to go to the ranch with him. When he came in Sunday night, I heard him go upstairs. I went to his room, and he told me this fellow Adams had killed a man. Did he say who was killed? Yes, this man, Wallman. Who did he say was there when the killing took place? He didn't say. He didn't mention anyone else. Did he say who killed him? No, he didn't make any explanation. Did he say anything about Vic Lund being there? No, Mr. Lund was in San Diego. Oh. Well, Mrs. McDaniels, you've listened to this man's story, this Adams here. How does his story jibe? It's nothing but lies. It's lies from start to finish. My brother did go up there with him. That's true. But when he says Vic was there, he's lying. And if he says I was there, he's lying. You know it, too, don't you, Adams? You know you're a liar. You're nothing but a stool pigeon and a crook, and you know it. You're trying to hide behind a pack of lies about somebody else. No, I'm not lying. I tell you the truth. Oh, Adams. You see this coat? Yes. That's Wallman's coat. I found it in your room. No. You see these clothes? We fished them out of the well on the ranch where you live. They're not mine. Oh, yes, they are. You see this dollar bill with a blood spot on it? I took that from your pocket when you were brought in here. It's not mine. I got it from Alfonso. You see this silver dollar? It's got your thumbprint on it. Well, he killed him. I picked up the money. Adams, where are your glasses? I lost them. No, you didn't. You left them in this coat, Wallman's coat, that you wore away from Wallman's house. There are specimens of blood in the rims around the lenses. I didn't do it. You see this little scrap of paper? 
That's the piece of paper you used to wipe off your glasses, isn't it? Yes. Uh, you used to wipe the blood off your glasses because you were standing behind Wellman when he was killed, weren't you? Yes. Then he was struck from behind. All right, Adam, start telling the truth. Who picked up the money? He did. You didn't pick it up? No, no, he did. Alfonso did. Then you killed him. Yes. With this bar. Yes. Okay, Adams, let's hear your story. Yeah. Went over to the house. It was about 2.30 Sunday. Alfonso went in the house. I went to the back door. Where's that, Senor Warren? Where's that? Uh, I need some cigarettes. I ain't got no cigarettes. All I got some between the act cigars, little ones. It'll be all right. Give me a package. Who's that? Who are you? Get out of here. Where's your money? What money? I ain't got no money. I, 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 I'm Shut a poor up. man. Shut up. Where's I, that money? I tell you, I ain't got... No! No! no. Shut up, you fool. What are we going to do? Do you want to toss of this yourself? Get hold of him and stop squawking. You've got to get him out of here. Thus, with cold-blooded bluntness, Willie Adams confessed the murder of Theodore Walton. In just a moment, we'll hear again from Captain Jewell. To continue our story about the American consumers being an increasingly careful and intelligent buyer, we refer again to the fact that he wants to know who are the authorities and most important users of a product. This time, we're talking about Sinclair motor oils. Sinclair writes the laws of lubrication, and eight major airlines, 150 railroads, great fleets of ships, and millions of motorists in 45 nations of the world depend upon Sinclair oils to protect the billions of dollars invested in their motor equipment. There are a dozen important reasons why you should use Sinclair oils in your motor, but this one is certainly sufficient. Most of the oils you buy contain petroleum jelly, which turns into a thin, detrimental liquid in your motor. The patented Sinclair refining process completely removes petroleum jelly from Sinclair oils. Don't gamble with incompletely refined oils when Sinclair opaline is only 25 cents a quart in tamper-proof cans. And follow the lead of those who know the most about gasoline. Get Rio Grande cracked. This quicker starting, faster accelerating, longer mileage gasoline will give you a new conception of performance. Get police car performance with Rio Grande cracked gasoline at your independent Rio Grande dealers tomorrow. And now, Captain Jewell. The perfect investigative work done by Captain Bright, deputies Hanby and Hunter, and other officers who worked on the case proved beyond a shadow of doubt that Willie Adams had killed Elman, that Rincon had been accomplished. These men were brought to trial and convicted of first-degree murder without recommendation. Their crime definitely failed to pay. Thank you, Captain Jewell. Los County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars. A cancellation of broadcast 205 regarding a murder in Leona Canyon. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rose and Quiz. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Calling All Cars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Alameda County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars. Broadcast 207 regarding a murder at 795 Pinedale Court in Hayward. That's all. Rolls and quits.
when 150 of the world's leading child specialists praised the scientific methods used by Dr. Defoe and his staff in caring for the Dion quintuplets. It is little wonder that many of you parents follow the same formula in caring for your own children. It is natural for us to profit by the experience of others when that experience is crowned with success. And so it is easy to understand why so many thousands of you motorists have followed the lead of the most noted gasoline specialists who recommend and use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. These men, the drivers of your police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency public service cars, chose Rio Grande cracked over all other gasolines for its quicker starting, steadier acceleration, longer mileage, greater reserve power, and higher speed capacity. Their continued and exclusive use of Rio Grande Cracked is based upon 55 million miles of experience during a single 12-month period. Profit by the valuable experience of those who drive the most and the hardest. Wheel into your nearest Rio Grande station tomorrow morning and begin getting police car performance in your own car with Rio Grande Cracked, the gasoline that is preferred by thinking motorists throughout the West. Inasmuch as the story we are to hear tonight was taken from the confidential files of the Alameda County Sheriff's Office, we have asked Sheriff M.B. Driver of Alameda County to open our program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In this series of programs, Rio Grande in its law enforcement work has constantly played in one key, the failure of crime to be a paying proposition. If an individual contemplating a crime, no matter what the motive, could know what every law enforcement officer knows, we would have no crime problem. The lawbreaker, in his fine opinion of himself, thinks that he can pit his wits against the experience of a host of officers. Such a man lacks intelligence. If he was intelligent, he wouldn't think that way. For a moment's calm consideration of the situation will tell him that his crime won't pay. I hope that this broadcast, like others in our sponsor's history, will prove the futility of crime. Take it from me, you can't get away with it. The scream of a siren knifed through the din of a driving rainstorm as Deputy Sheriff Douglas Webb and Grover Mull sped through the gathering night. Got knocked off this time, Grover. Nobody yet. Carl Daniels out in Hayward has been shot. Not expected to live. Who shot him? Nobody knows. Not even Daniels? No. Where was the rest of the family? Out all day. How did it happen? Oh, the old man came in and found a masked man in the house. Get a good look at him? I don't know. Daniels is still unconscious. Prowler? Maybe, maybe not. Now watch that truck. Doesn't make sense for an ordinary prowler to shoot a man down in his own house. They usually beat it out a back door. This guy left by the front. Now, where'd you get all the dope? Over the telephone. Killer must be either an amateur or a maniac. Or else... uh... Or else is right. Where did the old man live? Oh, with his daughter and son-in-law in Hayward. Prominent citizen out here. Yeah, I know it. I've known him for years. Well, maybe this case will give you a chance for that photographic hobby of yours. I hope so. I don't like for a case to break too easy. Past winking street lights, through the rain drenched towns, into the sparsely settled countryside, by lonely farmhouses flew the police car, siren blasting the storm tortured night. All the fury of fast motion, the rain ripping at the windshield, throbbing motor, whining trees, and screaming siren blended into a fiendish symphony of trouble and impending terror. At last, the car swung into a graveled roadway and slid to a stop in front of a house in Pinedale Court. Journey's in, my lad. Huh. All the lights in the place on from the looks of it. Ominously quiet otherwise. Which marks you as deaf or unobservant. Hear that radio? Hmm, that's odd, isn't it? Very. Let's go in. Are you in the habit of walking in blood? What? Take a look at the floor. Oh, 
something ought to be done about that. Oh, thank God you've come. We've been nearly crazy since we heard of Father shooting. Uh, what's, uh, what's your name, please? Uh, I'm Mrs. Mitchell, Mr. Daniel's daughter. This is my husband. Oh, please sit down, dear. Where's your father? He's been taken to the hospital. When did you find out about this? When we got home a few minutes ago. Dr. Struble was here. Who's he? Well, he's our next-door neighbor. He gave my father-in-law first aid and sent him to the hospital. What hospital? The Hayward Sanitarium. Do you mind if I shut this radio off? No, 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 of course not. Quiet without that thing. Uh, Now, Mrs. Mitchell, please tell us exactly what happened. Well, there really isn't very much I can tell. We got home about 20 minutes ago. That is, Everett and I. We were surprised to find the front door partly open. Then we thought that maybe Father had left it that way. We walked in and stepped right into that, that awful pool of blood. Oh, please, please, can't you make this as brief as possible, gentlemen? My wife's under an awful strain. Yes, we can see that. Well, she can't stand very much questioning. Yeah, that's plain. Neither one of us knows very much about this crime. But right after we got home, Dr. Struble came over and told us about it. Uh, how did this doctor find out about it? Well, he says father staggered into his house. He'd been shot in the abdomen, but he managed to gasp out that he'd been shot by a masked man. Here, in the hallway? Yes. And then, evidently, the man had been waiting for him. Did your father-in-law have any enemies that you know of? None that I know anything about. Was your father-in-law out most of the day? Well, yes, he just returned. From what Dr. Struble told us, Father didn't know the man and couldn't give any reason for the attack. Have you been to the hospital yet? Well, no. We would have gone right over there, but we knew you officers would be here in a little while, and, well, we wanted to be here when you came. And you don't know of any enemies he might have had? Well, no. Oh, he was the kindest and gentlest man I ever knew. Oh, there isn't a person living who would have hurt him. Yet somebody did. Uh, have you looked to see if any valuables are missing? Well, no, we haven't. Oh, my wife was too much upset. Oh, by the way, can I remove that blood? Oh, yes, yeah, surely, but don't disturb anything else. Oh, I'd like to clean that rug, too, if I may. Yes, go ahead. No, no, I better leave that. We'll be wanting to take that to headquarters. Well, oh, yeah, keep these people busy while I look around outside. Okay. <laughs> With the suddenness characteristic of a California rain, the storm had lulled. A gibbous moon shouldered over Grizzly Peak as Deputy Mull, flashlight in hand, prepared to survey the scene. Banana trees waved their monstrous leaves like shrouds for the dead. Tall palms rustled and chuckled in a ribald cackle of diabolic glee. With his flashlight, Mull traced the almost washed-out trail of blood over the sinister track the wounded man had followed. At the corner of the steps leading to the Mitchell home, Mull discovered a footprint. He was preparing to remove the turf when a police car pulled to the curb. What you doing, Mull? I yeah, just found what looks like a fairly good footprint. I got a call on this a few minutes ago. Figured it was about time the chief of police got on the job. So far, we've found absolutely nothing in the case except this footprint. Well, let's have a look at it. There it is, right there by that bush. Hmm. Must have been a fairly large man. And evidently in a hurry. Yeah, must have been, judging by the distance this print is from the steps. So far, that footprint... And a bloody rug are the people's exhibits in this case. Shine your light down here a minute, will you? Yeah, it's a pretty clear print. Mm. Grover, take a look at this. What's wrong? Nothing. See that little lump of mud? Yeah, but there's lots of mud in that print. Yeah, but take this magnifying glass and have a close look. That lump right there. That was on the man's foot before he came to this house. How do you know? Well, you'll notice there isn't another piece of mud around here exactly like that one on the print. Uh, What's different about this one? You see those tiny reddish particles in there? They're iron or some other metallic substance. Yeah, I do see them now. They sort of gleam under the light. The way I doped this out is that the killer picked this mud up in some other part of town. It clung to his shoe right where the heel joins the sole, and when he jumped down here, it was jarred loose. Well, it does fit that position in the footprint. It may sound fantastic, but... I have an idea that if we find where that mud came from, we'll know a lot more about who shot Daniels. Boy, that's doping it out to a fine point. Well, it's not as impossible as it sounds. Not much. No, it isn't. My men know every inch of this town. We'll simply search till we find the spot that matches this specimen. Just like that, huh? Yeah. And when we've found it, we'll investigate every house and person in that neighborhood till we find somebody who's seen the man who made that print. Oh, you can think of the hardest jobs. Well, there's no telling what we'll uncover. We'll just take this little dab of mud... Put it in this envelope and take it with us. Well, anyway, I think I'll 
dig this print up and take it in and have the boys make a moulage of it. Oh, and uh, I think it might be a good idea to try young Mitchell's shoes in that print, too. And Daniel's, for that matter. The footprint was checked against every possible shoe that could have made it. Yet no one was found who had been near the house on the fateful night. Every resident of Pinedale Court was questioned, but no one had seen or heard anything out of the ordinary. Next morning, Webb and Mull meet to compare notes on the investigation. Webb, I thought about this case all night. I have got an uncanny feeling that we've overlooked a bet someplace. Not that I want to appear repetitious, but so have I. I refuse to believe in an absolutely clueless crime. What do you mean, clueless? Oh, there's a clue somewhere, if we can only find it. How do you figure this one is clueless? There's the footprint and that speck of mud. Oh, I'm not forgetting that, but that footprint is good only as circumstantial evidence after we get our man. But how about that mud? Well, between you and me, Doug, it's a thousand to one shot that Chief Silva or his men will never find the place it came from. Now, I got a feeling we've overlooked something that's vital, yet it's so obvious that we haven't noticed it. Why don't we go out and check over the place again? Wait a minute. I got it. Got what? Remember that radio? What about it? Well, when we started talking to Mrs. Mitchell, she reached over and turned it off. Remember? Now that you recall it, I do. Doesn't that strike you as a false note? How? Why should the radio have been playing at all? By George, you're right. Remember, they, they say they had just arrived... And when they came in, they found the place open and blood on the floor. Yeah. It's not very likely that under those circumstances they'd turn on the radio, is it? Not very. Of course, people do strange things under the stress of emotion, but I doubt very much whether they'd tune in a jazz program. Uh, maybe Daniel... No, he couldn't have. According to the story he told Dr. Struble, he was shot immediately after stepping into the house. He wouldn't have stopped to turn on a radio after that. No, not very likely. His main idea was to get help. You're right. Now, let's shoot out there and look into this. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell, we're checking every angle on this shooting. It just occurred to us that there was something a little strange about that radio playing at your house last night. Radio? Say, hey, that's right. But that radio wasn't working yesterday morning. What? Wasn't working. Why, we heard it playing last night. Oh, I know it. I remember my wife shutting it off. We didn't notice it at the time, but, but that radio's been broken for about three days. Are you sure of that? Well, I'm positive. I remember wanting to hear a news broadcast yesterday morning, and my wife reminded me that I'd forgotten to call the repairman. We were going to send it to the shop today. Yet it was playing perfectly last night. You're sure your wife didn't uh, have a man repair the radio? I'm very sure. As a matter of fact, we had talked about it on the way home last night. Well, since you and your wife weren't home, it was obviously impossible for you to turn it on. It doesn't seem very likely that your father-in-law did. That leaves only the gunman. And that's fantastic. Oh, maybe, but it's the best theory we've got right now. Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Mitchell, did you find any articles missing from the house? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, several pieces of silver are gone, and some old jewelry we kept upstairs in Father's bedroom. I think we'd better take a look at that radio. Let's see if it works now. It's working now, all right. Wait, we'll see. It takes a little time to heat up. You ought to have one like them in the movies. Well, that settles it. Now, here's where I get busy with that fingerprint camera. Picked yourself out a real job this time. Don't worry. If they're here, I'll get them. Well, you'll probably find plenty of them. Well, how can you tell which are the new ones? You can't. Well, then how is finding prints on the radio going to help catch the man who shot my father-in-law? That's a job for Harnden, our identification expert. Under Harnden's direction, a check was made of every radio salesman and repairman who might have handled the interior parts of the radio. All of them were possible suspects, but one by one, each was eliminated. Meanwhile, the work of Chief of Police Silva and his men was going on in another part of town. Then, on the fifth day after the shooting, Carl Daniels died. Slowly, remorselessly, the net of the law tightened around the slayer. Hello, Silva. I came over as soon as I got your call. What's new? Well, Mull, I've got a description of your phantom gunman. What? That's right. Did you get it from that piece of mud? That's right, too. But how? Well, we went over this town practically inch by inch. Finally, we found the same kind of earth in a gully out on the edge of town. We went over every square inch of that gully. Good Lord, man, that's an awful amount of work. 
Oh, we don't worry about that when it's necessary to trap a killer. What else did you find? Well, at one point in the gully, we found what was left of a lunch. You know, eggshells, pieces of bread, and a sheet of water-soaked newspaper. Yeah, handout, huh? That's what we figure. Now, that lunch must have been put up by some housewife. There was a penciled notation of some sort on the margin of the newspaper. My men are out now checking every house in the neighborhood, trying to find the house where that lunch came from. Oh, but there are 50, 600 homes in this town. Okay, we'll check them all. Did we find where that lunch and that newspaper came from? Chief Silver speaking. Yeah? All right, I'll be right out. That was Mac. He's found the woman who put up that lunch, Mrs. Rowland. What a break. Wait a minute. Let's take a run down and see if Harndon's got anything definite on those prints. Maybe we can get something for this woman to identify. Well, Harnden, what have you found out about those prints in the Daniels case? I've eliminated five of them. The sixth belongs to a man named Reed. Here's his card. Right, we're getting hot, Louis. Hmm. Joseph M. Reed, alias Rogers and Davis. San Quentin, 1923. Assault with deadly weapon. Served six years. Released 1929. Got a picture of this bird, Harnden? Yeah, right here. A mug picture. Hmm. Mrs. Rowland ought to be able to identify that. If that's our man. He'll have a hard time explaining how his fingerprints got on Mitchell's radio if he isn't our man. Oh, by the way, did you list that stolen silver and jewelry with the pawn shops? Yeah, with every shop in the Bay region. Good. That'll help. Let's show this stuff to Mrs. Rowland and see what she says. Mrs. Rowland, we're trying to get a line on the man who shot Carl Daniels. One of my men reports that you've recognized this newspaper as one you wrapped a lunch in a few days ago. Yes, that's the paper, all right. I remember that man coming to the back door here, asking for something to eat. That was the day Mr. Daniels was shot. I remember the rain. It was raining at the time, as a matter of fact. And do you remember what the man looked like? Well, he wasn't a very big man. About your size, I think. He was rather dark. He had a little mustache. He rather short. He had very deep lines at the corners of his mouth and between his eyes. Uh, is this picture anything like the man? Why, it's the same man. Are you sure of that? Well, I'm positive. I'll never forget just how that man looked. His right ear stood out a little, just as it does right there in the picture. Miss Rowland, we want you to be certain about this. Oh, I'm very certain. That's a picture of the man I gave the lunch to, all right. You remember which way he went after you gave the lunch to him? Yes, he went down toward that little creek or uh, that gully down there in the next block. Well, thank you, Mrs. Rowland. Oh, uh, we may have to call you again if we get this man. We need a personal identification. Oh, that's all right. I'll be glad to identify him any time I see him again. Well, Grover, looks like we're getting hotter. Yeah, it looks that way, but I still don't get the motive for the crime. Well, I haven't any doubt about Reed doing the job, though. Have you? No, but there are a lot of things unexplained. That radio, for instance. Well, it's got me, too. I can't figure that one out. I'm going down to the office and check up on this Reed guy a little further. Three months go by. Officers continue to be on the lookout for the slayer of Carl Daniels. Then, one rainy afternoon, exactly three months to the day from the time of the murder, the telephone in the office of Deputy Mull shrieks a sinister alarm. Sheriff's office, Mull speaking. Solomon, down on A Street. There's a fellow down here trying to sell some of the things you described to me. Those things that were stolen from the Daniels place. Keep them there by some hook or crook. I'll be right down. But hurry, Sheriff. Hey, what are you trying to do, kid me? That stuff's worth ten times that amount. Five dollars is all I could give you. No more than my own mother. Why, you little runt. I ought to poke you in the nose. Well, so go ahead. I still wouldn't give you any more than five dollars. That'll be about enough, Reed. Come along with me. For you. Sheriff's office. Try and make me, copper. I, I, my showcase, my unbreakable showcase. Keep down, keep down. Somebody's hiding continue. behind that trash can on the sidewalk. Keep out of sight. Oh, stop him, somebody. Oh, my, 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 my fine plate glass window. Stop him. That ought to be all he's got. All right, Reed. Get him up. 
You wouldn't have got me tougher if I'd have had any more bullets. Yeah, maybe not. Come on, you mug. That'll hold you for a while. <laughs> Hello, Webb. Where were you during the excitement? Out on another call. Who's your friend? This is Joe Reed, the gentleman we strongly suspect of killing Carl Daniels. He also tried to put a few slugs into me. How about it, Reed? Ah, uh, what's the use? Sure, I killed him. Why? Uh, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Suppose, uh, suppose you tell us about it. Of course, we're going to use... Anything you say against her, you know that. Yeah, sure. Are you the man Mrs. Rowland gave the handout to? Yeah. Yeah, I was broke. I went by her place. I was going to break in and see what I could find, but she was home. So I just asked her for a handout. What did you do then? I went down the gully and that what she gave me. What were you doing in Hayward in the first place? I, I always worked a little time. You can get into places easier, and if your folks are home, you can usually get something to eat. How did you happen to get into the Mitchell place? Eh, it, was, it was just an accident. I didn't pick it for no special reason. Just started working at the corner. I was going to work my way along the block. How did you get in? I used a skeleton key on the side door. Did you turn on that radio? Sure, sure. I always do that. It makes the neighbors think the folks is home. They don't suspect nothing. But the Mitchell radio was out of order. Sure, but I fixed it. I used to fix radios in Quentin. I learned it there. How come we didn't find any fingerprints except on the radio? I always wear gloves when I work. It keeps my hands clean. I had to take them off when I fixed the radio, though. That was a mistake. Yeah, I know that now. How did you happen to shoot, Daniels? Well, I I was upstairs going to the dresser drawers, and I looked out, and I see this fella coming up to walk. I run downstairs, and when he come in the front door, I let him have it. But why? I don't know. I guess I get excited too easy. Uh, what did you do after you got away? I went over to Frisco and got me a room. I gave the jewelry to my girlfriend, Conchita. But she tried to two-time me, and I took it away from her. And tried to sell it to Sally, huh? Sure. I needed a dough. Well, where's this girlfriend now? Uh, she went down to Mexico City. Some bird stabbed her one night. Now listen to me, Conchita. I tell you many times, I will not stand for you being with Pablo. Who do you think you are to be telling me who I can go with and who I cannot? Just the same, I am telling you. And you are going to do as I say. Listen, I sent better men than you are to jail in this state. <laughs> See, I know what you mean, I suppose. Like your boyfriend, Reed, eh? Don't say anything about him. At least he was white. He's more than you are. Ah, uh, to cochina desgraciada! Oh, oh, Stop it. You're choking me. Uh, isn't that too bad? Oh. What do you think I'm trying to do? Oh, please, Pancho. Don't do that. Oh. Oh. All right. But remember, next time, I won't let you off so easy. I remember. Uh, where is all that jewelry you said this re gave you? He took it away from me. Don't lie to me. I told you when you went to San Francisco not to come back without money. Or something I could get money with. I am not lying, Pancho. You did take this stuff away from me. That is why I come back. Uh, you came back. What good are you to me unless you bring me money? Hmm. Is that all I mean to you, Pancho? Why not? What else? But I love you, Pancho. Love from you? Oh, but <laughs> it is true, Panchito. I go anywhere with you. I do anything for you. Get away from me! <laughs> Oh, you hit me for the last time, Pancho. Hey, put down the knife. Put it down. No. Put it down. I no, I am going to kill you. I am going to kill uh, you, do you uh, hear me? You try to kill Pancho, eh? You try to kill him, eh? There. <laughs> How are you like that, eh? Pancho. Uh, uh, Pancho. Uh, uh, uh. Hey, tell me something. How come you guys was looking for me? I didn't leave no traces of my work, except the radio. Well, we got some pretty good prints off of that radio, and Chief Silver's men traced you by the mud you left in that footprint in front of the Mitchell house. Jeez. I never thought of that. I knowed my old lady was right. She always told me to wipe the mud off in my feet. <laughs> Be 
speaking of crime, some motor fuels are guilty of treason on the highways in that they contribute to the delinquency of your motor. That kind of crime does not pay either. This advertising world is filled with extravagant claims and glowing promises. But you can't fool all the people all the time. As a matter of fact, you can't fool the truly motor-wise any of the time. The officials of 30 leading cities and counties throughout California know what they are doing when after putting all motor fuels through their paces, they issue orders that only Rio Grande cracked gasoline shall be used to power their emergency equipment. They were looking for a gasoline that would deliver maximum performance at a minimum expenditure of the taxpayer's money, and they found it in Rio Grande Cracked. We do not ask that you take our word for it. We do believe that the experience of these officials is an eloquent, unsolicited, and unpaid-for testimonial that should convince every prudent motorist to find out for himself. Do this very thing tomorrow morning. Drop in at the nearest Rio Grande station. Fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, and you will discover the meaning of real police car performance. Reed, in view of his confession, received a life sentence in San Quentin, where he is now incarcerated. Thus ended a case that was a mixture of modern criminological science and old-time tried and true police methods. And thus is added to the records another crime that did not pay. County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all sheriff's cars. A cancellation of broadcast 207 regarding a murder. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quits. Narrator Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for Rio Grande. program created by Rio Grande. Up on this police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Don't get to any date. The guy's an accident. This may be an attempt murder. That's all. Rolls and quits. kind of a tune does your self-starter play these brisk mornings? A short and sweet chord in G or a lengthy funeral dirge? If your motor doesn't take its cue at the first downbeat, don't blame the starter. Your gasoline is off-key. Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline is the most harmonious blend of five vitally essential qualities purchasable in California, the most highly competitive market in the entire world. In the chilly morn and evening or in the heat of midday sun, Rio Grande Cracked delivers quicker one-punch starting, steadier velvet smooth acceleration, greater speed, longer mileage, and a more abundant supply of reserve power. Who says so? The most exacting and best qualified judges of gasoline to be found anywhere. The men who drive the most 
as the pilots of your police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency equipment. Yes, the officials of 30 leading cities and counties throughout California specify Rio Grande Crack as the gasoline to be used exclusively in powering all their emergency public serving cars. Many thousands of motorists have profited by the experience of these most eminent authorities. And so may you. There's a tank full of police car performance gasoline waiting for you at the nearest red and white station of your friendly Rio Grande dealer. Drive in tomorrow morning and call for it by either name. Rio Grande Cracked or that police car performance gasoline. They mean the same. It's our pleasure to present Inspector Anthony Collins. Good evening, friends. Death never takes a holiday, and crime never ceases its unrelenting warfare with the police. Irrespective of motive, murder is still being considered a crime, and the police are daily tracking down men and women who thought they could kill and get away with it. Occasionally, a crime is so cleverly disguised that apparently the criminal does get away with his crime, but sooner or later, officers of the law will unravel the skein of clues that leads eventually to the capture and punishment of the offender. Tonight's story is stranger than fiction case. Obviously, we cannot use the name of the major motion picture studio in which it occurred or the names of stars or directors, but that in no way to detract from the fascination of this intrigue and its solution. One day, late in August, a group of chorus girls were rehearsing for a forthcoming picture on one of the sound stages of a motion picture lot. Brother, Alan, my don't you things know what a hit kick is? It's one, two, three kick. The simplest routine on earth. You learn it in kindergarten, and you dames are muffing it. Try it again. From the beginning? Yes, from the beginning. you're supposed to be. <laughs> Why don't you go back to the house hash house where you belong? And you. Oh, me? Yes, you. What are you imitating? A leaping fawn or a dying duck? A dying duck? Uh, uh, no, it's not a dying duck. and I don't know what a leaping fawn is. Well, watch yourself do that hit stick in that mirror over there and you soon will know. Now look, this is the last I'm going to show you. Oh, thank goodness for that. And no wise cracks. Now watch. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, kick. Oh, oh why didn't you say you wanted a hit kick? Listen to her. There's oh, another one that Nelson Dame picked out. All right. Come on. Let's do it. Maybe someday a cameraman will want to take a picture of this. I'm afraid. All right, let's go, Joe. From the beginning? Yes, the beginning. One, two, three, four. Stop it! Go to... Go to lunch. Go somewhere. Get out of my sight. Go out in the alley and practice. What did I ever do to deserve this? Uh, dumb bunch, ain't they? Dumb. Any one of those dames could start an asylum all by herself. Well, Why would you pick them out? Pick them out! Me? Pick them out! Don't make me laugh. Say, if I had my way, I'd throw the whole line out. And those lousy tunes with them. It's like, Sammy, you can't. Well, you couldn't whistle one of those casualties with a pipe or pan. you got to have tunes people can whistle. Oh. Now, look at that junk. Listen, if that's a song. Can I hear what? something about tunes in this production? You may have, but you didn't hear half enough. The person who wrote those songs ought to be shot. Sammy, I never in all my life. Sammy, 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 this is the lady who wrote the tunes. Oh. You claim to be the lady who wrote these tunes. Yes. You're the man who was producing the dances, aren't you? What do you mean, was? It's now a question of who's the most important around here. You or I. If I have any influence, you're out. Listen, lady. I got a contract. Claim it. Those numbers are going into this picture. You're going out of it. Now, suit yourself. <laughs> Now, 
Wait a minute, Sammy. Take it easy. You give me a contract to produce the musical numbers in this picture. Then you load me up with all the kitchen mechanics in Hollywood who think they can dance. And on top of that, this Flora Nelson dame writes the world's worst tunes, and I have to use them. Well, I won't do it. Why, you tired? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, both of you. We break no contract, and we'll have no walkout. Flora, let me talk to Sammy alone for a minute, will you? I'd like to talk to him alone. I'm staying here. Anything you've got to say to him, you can say with me here. All right. All right, I'll say it to you then. Emmy, you're absolutely right. If you can find better girls for the line, hire them. As far as the music is concerned, we'll use a couple of florist tunes and we'll call in Dave Metzner to the direct. You mean we can get Dave out here from New York and I can fire those mechanics? Hire and hire anybody you choose. You are the boss. How about this Flora Dame? She's my worry. Get busy. Okay, boss. Now let's go over to stage eight. We're paying an orchestra overtime now. We ought to be ready to rehearse that song from the new picture. Okay, boss. But if I told you all I know about this dame, you wouldn't argue with I'm me. I'm not arguing with you, Sam. Listen, you little rat. Keep your trap shut about me or something's liable to happen to you. Not to you, sister. I can take anything you can hand out. All right, Bill, we're ready to hear that song of Gene Stone. Okay, now let's go. Miss Anderson, are you ready for this time to fall out? I'm all set. The stars are all aglow, and skies are blue above. Is it whisper low? This night was made for love. The hour is growing late, so you really shouldn't wait. It's time for you to fall in love with me. It isn't right to wait, sweet moments such as this. We should both make haste to find romantic bliss. The stars will fade away, so don't let your heart delay. It's time for you to fall in love with me. And the time of flowing. Golden moments steal away. Oh, we'll soon be going. Gather stardust while you may. The sleeping is complete, a perfect time and place. Sweet heart, let me greet the dawn in your embrace. The stars and skies of blue seem to say they know it too. It's time for you to fall in love with me. The hour is growing late, so you really shouldn't wait. It's time for you to fall in love with me. The stars will fade away, so don't let your heart delay. It's time for you to fall in love with me. And the time of flowing. Golden moments steal away. Love will soon be going. Gather stardust while you may. The setting is complete. A perfect time and place. Sweet heart, let me greet the dawn in your embrace. The stars and skies of blue seem to say they know it too. It's time for you to fall in love with me. Well, what do you think of it, Sammy? Sammy. Well, Mary, now that's more like it. That's the kind of stuff we've got to have to put the picture that's on. That's the kind you will have. Ah, it suits me, boss. Well, I'll see you later. i got to get back to the dance set. So long, Sammy. <laughs> What's wrong out there? What's happened? Please, it's Sammy. Sammy? Sammy, what? Where is he? There, under that big lamp. It fell on him from way up there. And now, Mr. B, he's there. Well, tell me what you see today. Oh, 
Oh, nothing much. Bill and I went over that accident case out the studio. Accident? What happened? Some guy walked under a lamp. The lamp was on its way to the floor from the catwalk, and the guy isn't with us anymore. Who was he? Name's Fabian, I think. Yeah, Sammy Fabian. Isn't it a little unusual for those lamps to fall? Well, that's what I thought. I just had a talk with Captain Wallace. I reported his probable murder, incidentally. Murder? What makes you think that? Oh, just some things I overheard. Anderson speaking. It's Anderson. I want you and Tommy Devlin to follow through on that movie studio case. I'm not sure Devlin is so far wrong on his hunch on that deal. Report to me in about an hour for further instructions. Yes, sir. Well, that's that. <laughs> I believe, are the New York Messers. Oh, come on in, darling. I'm hot at work. Yes, I heard you. Come on, Sally. I want you to hear it. I knew it. Here it comes. Oh, but you like this one. It's beautiful, Dave. So are you. I wrote it for you, too. Seems you've written all your songs for me lately. Why not? You are the sweetest girl in the world, you know. Oh, confound it. Somebody always knocks at the wrong time. Telegram for Dave Metzner. Excuse me, dear. Mm-hmm. Sally. Sally, listen. Want four tunes by August 15th for use midnight merriment. Name on price, please. Sally. Sally is what we've been waiting for. We're leaving tonight. We're going on that... Please? The telegram didn't say anything about me. <laughs> you don't think I'd move a ninja out of this town without you, do you? Oh, it'll be fun, Sally. It'll be fun. I'll write all the stuff I can on the train. We'll take my little studio piano. Huh? We'll have to pack immediately. Well, what's the matter? I want a magazine. Oh, you won't need it. You can listen to my songs. Come on, we only have four minutes. Well, Mommy's at the gate. Go ahead. Well, don't you dare miss that train. I won't. I'll hurry. Boy, boy, here. Hi, Mr. Metzner. What is it? Telegram, sir. Oh, thanks. Thank you. What is it, Dave? Well, I don't know. Cup? I hope they haven't changed their minds. <laughs> Sally, Sally, listen. Dave Metzner, Grand Central Station, New York. Have you ever noticed the similarity in rhythm between the clicking of a railway car wheel and the foxtrot Nola? Unsigned. I wonder what the devil that means. And back in the office of the head of the motion picture studio. Come in, Joe. Sit down. This is Tommy Devlin from the Examiner and Lieutenant Sanderson from the police department. Hi, boys. They would like to ask you a few questions about their accident yesterday. Anything I can do to help, I'd be glad to do. Sammy was a swell guy. Well, just what happened, Joe, as you thought. Well, I, uh, I didn't exactly see it. You see, uh, uh I was out in the alley talking to the girls after, uh, Sammy bawled them out and... Uh... Oh, what did he bawl them out about, Joe? Well, uh, that was after he had his run-in with Flora Nelson and... He was uh, sort of excited and everything, you know. Who's Flora Nelson? A songwriter here in the studio. Go on, Joe. Well, after Sammy and Flora had their fight... Oh, what... fight? Yes, Sammy and Miss Nelson disagreed on some songs. Nothing serious. Where was she when this accident happened? Well, I, uh, I saw her going upstairs to her office while Sammy was in the studio talking to Mr. Pease. Did anybody else see this lamp fall? Well, me and, uh, me and Daisy were standing just outside the studio door when we heard Sammy yell. I think she saw it. We'll talk to her later, Tommy. Let's take a look at that lamp again. Well, there she is. What do you think, Sandy? The question in mind is, did it fall or was it pushed? Meaning which? Doesn't make sense that a lamp as big as this one would become loosened by vibration in a studio that's built to eliminate vibration. Now, that makes sense, too. So what? So somebody had a reason for eliminating Sammy Fabian. Well, assuming that, why and who? Let's ask Daisy. And after Sammy said the tunes were stolen, what happened? Well, then this Florida woman said, uh, don't you accuse me of stealing tunes or I'll have you out of here if you have to be carried out. What did Fabian say to that? Well, he told her he had a contract. Then what? 
Then Flora said she'd have her tunes in the picture or he'd be out of the picture. Well, thanks, Daisy. Just don't mention this to anybody, will you? Oh, no, Lieutenant. Well, where do we go from here? Flora Nelson's office for a set of nice fingerprints to compare with those we found on the lamp. Ridiculous. It's silly. I've got to get this done. I've got to work. How can I work if only those wheels would stop that infernal clicking, clicking, clicking? Can't let Sally know. Can't let anybody know. They, they think I was crazy. Maybe I am. <laughs> oh, no. I'll try again. Now, let me see. I had an idea this morning while the train was standing still. Oh, well, that's something like it. Now, now I've got it. I've got it. Listen to that. There it is again. Why can't I get that out of my mind? I've got to get it out. I'll be ruined if I don't. I've got to do something. I've got to do something. Who is it? It's Sally, Dave. Oh, oh, what do you want? I want to see you, Dave. I must see you. I'm busy, Sally. Can't you leave me alone? If you won't be polite and ask me, and I'll come in anyway. Dave, something's wrong. I'm entitled to know what it is. Tell me, Dave. Nothing's wrong. I, I'm busy. I, I'm trying to work. How can I work with you giving me pitying looks all the time? Well, why should I be giving you pitying looks, Dave? I don't know, but you have been. You've been talking to people about me, too. You think I'm crazy. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I'll show them. I'll oh, show listen, them. Oh, dear. Uh, come on out on the observation platform. We can talk it over. Uh, talk what over? What's there to talk over? Lots, Dave. Before we left New York, you told me you loved me. I do love you. And you asked me to marry you. You remember? Of course I remember. When we boarded this train, we were as happy as two people could be. Then you changed. You've become morose, irritable, and so oh. We've been on the train three days, and you've accomplished nothing. Say, are you criticizing me? Oh, no, dear, I'm not criticizing you. But, Dave, this is your big chance. It's what you've been waiting for so long. You've got to have four songs ready when you step off the train. They've got to go into a picture. Dave, don't you realize... You're afraid I won't make good, aren't you? Afraid I won't make enough money to buy you... Dave, how can you say that? To We're me. not married yet. You can't come in here and dictate to me. No, oh, I'll write their songs. They'll be ready. I have an idea. It goes like this. You want to listen? You hear that? That song? Now, don't you love it? That's no to your face. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Great. Fits everything perfectly. Songs, rhythm. All oh, they'll get their rhythm. I'll give it to them. Oh, Dave, come to your senses, Dave. Well, you think I'm crazy, don't you? Songs, music, rhythm. I'll get rid of it. I'll show them. They can't ruin me. Stop it, Dave. Don't tear up the numbers you finished. What, there are more than that. I'll tear his heart out if I ever get my hands on him. I'll kill him. Oh, Dave, please, please be quiet. Get out of here. For God's sake, get out of here. Get out, get out, get out. Look, look, would you mind waiting just a minute, Mr. Sanderson? I'm awfully busy right now. Oh, sure, go ahead. We'll wait. I've got the production with thousands of dollars spent already. I bring a man out here from the East to write songs, and all he brings me is a nervous breakdown and a fixation for singing Nola. Nola? Why, that's, that's quite, Tommy. Mr. Pease, you say this man had a nervous breakdown on the train? Yes, yes, he's in the hospital now. Anybody you know of who might well not want him to get that job? Listen, Sanderson, you're making a melodrama out of this case. You've been snooping around here a week now, and all you've got is a few fingerprints and a theory. I'm telling you, Sammy Fabian's death was an accident. This breakdown of Metzner's is just a coincidence. It's bad, it's unfortunate, and to me it's costly, but it's still a coincidence. Well, maybe you're right. Oh, good morning, Miss Nelson. Good morning, Mr. Sanderson. How's business a fine rainy morning? As usual, Miss Nelson, as usual. Go into my office, floor. I'll listen to the songs later. Excuse me, won't you, Mr. Sanderson? Oh, sure, sure. Don't mind us. We'll be around. Say, hey, wasn't Nola the name of that song we found in her office? Yes, and that's the name of the song she scribbled on that scratch pad. Hey, Tommy, chase down to the Hollywood Telegraph office and check up on telegrams leaving here last week. I've got a hunch. I'll wait in the outer office. Well, Tommy, what'd you find out? Plenty, copper. 
The records show that a woman answering this Nelson dame's general description sent a telegram to Dave Metzner about a week ago. Here's a copy of it. Pardon me. Are you a police officer? Oh, yes. Why? Well, I heard you mention Dave Metzner. You see, I'm Sally Dane. I know Dave Metzner very well. We came out here together. He was going to write some songs for Mr. Pease for his new picture. Listen. That's one of Dave's songs. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure he wrote it for me. I'd know it anywhere. I'm going to... Oh, uh, wait a minute, Miss Dane. I'm Lieutenant Sanderson. This is Tommy Devlin, the news hawk. We'd like to talk to you a little more about this. Let's go down to headquarters. I have a feeling we're about to crack this case. Hey, wait a minute, hold the phone. Uh, Tommy, give me that telegram you got from Miss Dane. And here, uh, send a telephoto of this envelope we found in Miss Nelson's apartment to the New York police. Have them call me back. All right. Yes, here's a description of that telegram. L65-17, S-E-R-P-D-R-N, Hollywood, California, 12.15 p.m. That's right. I want to see the clerk who took that message right away. Come in. I'm the clerk who took that telegram you phoned about. Oh, here. Ever see that woman before? Hmm. Nice picture, isn't it? Yes, she's the woman who sent the wire. That cinches it. Let's go. Yeah, not so fast. Wait a minute. Lieutenant Sanderson speaking. Okay, put him on. Say, Tommy, take this down. New York calling. All right. Typewriter number B19476386. Okay. Run it to Huntley Downs, July and August. Have you got him? Hold him. Tell him Flora Nelson confessed to stealing Metzner's manuscript. See what he says to that. Okay, thanks. I've sent for Miss Nelson. She'll be here in a moment. Come in. Oh, come in, Flora. You know Lieutenant Sanderson and Mr. Devlin? I've seen them around. They would like to ask you a few questions. I told them you wouldn't mind. What kind of questions? The kind the police usually ask, Miss Nelson. Police? Do you mind? Why, uh, no, no, not at all. I understand the late Mr. Fabian didn't think much of your music. But I didn't think much of the late Mr. Fabian. So I understand. Just what do you mean by that? I also gather that you didn't care for one Dave Metzner. How does that concern you? It doesn't directly. You see, stealing copyrighted works is handled by the federal authorities. It's a lie. Who says I stole Dave Metzner's song? Hunt Huntley Downs, a gentleman now in custody of the New York police. Laura, is this true? I'll answer that for you, Mr. Pease. Downs has confessed that he stole the songs and sent them to Miss Nelson. In her apartment, we found burned copies of both songs. How dared you go into my apartment? We can also prove that she sent a telegram to Metzner in an attempt to ruin him. Suppose I did send him that wire. I didn't think he was that near nuts. Well, if you gentlemen are through asking questions, I'll go. So sorry. But there's a little matter of a killing a man still to be settled. You've got your nerve making such accusations against me. You can't prove a thing. Miss Nelson, the police don't go about making statements they can't prove. Now, we'd like to have your side of the story. But we must remind you about it being used against you. May I see you to our police car? Any objection if I use Mr. Peters' washroom a moment? I'd like to powder my nose. None at all. You won't need it, though. Not where you're going. Maybe not. Mind if I use your phone, Mr. Peace? Thanks. Listen, sister. Get me the examiner's city desk. Better keep your eye on that dame, Sandy. No other doors to that place. You won't run away. Hello, Ed. Here's a lead on that studio case. Lieutenant Leroy Sanderson of the police department, following every possible clue, succeeded today in arresting Flora Nelson for the murder of... Oh, wait a minute. Hello, Ed. Still that story. Here's a new lead. Faced with arrest for the murder of Sammy Fabian, studio dance director, and possible charges of stealing copyrighted songs, Flora Nelson committed suicide this afternoon by shooting herself in the washroom. What? Oh, nuts. Make it her head, then. <laughs> On 
unbeaten and untied is a phrase that applies to very few football teams and to only one gasoline, Rio Grande Crack. It has the unbeatable triple threat combination of greater speed, power and economy, and no other brand has been able to tie the quicker charging getaway and the smoother acceleration of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. When this finer motor fuel won the assignment of powering the emergency cars of 30 leading California cities and counties, it was pitted against the toughest sort of opposition. Last year, it gave a perfect performance in 55 million miles of law enforcement driving. No wonder many thousands of motorists cheer the winning performance of a gasoline that goes through every season with an unbeaten and untied record. If you haven't experienced the thrill of such performance, join the growing army of loyal users of Rio Grande cracked gasoline not later than tomorrow morning. Get into the game yourself. Wheel in at the nearest red and white station of your Rio Grande dealer, take on a tank full of Rio Grande cracked gasoline, and it will win police car performance for your car. And now, Inspector Collins... Obviously, the names in tonight's story have, with the exception of the officers involved, been fictitious. There's an old saying, let sleeping dogs lie. I think that applies as well to crimes of this sort as any other thing. It is sufficient to point out that Flora Nelson's crime did not pay. Thank you, Inspector Collins. Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 208 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case committed suicide in the presence of arresting officer. That's all. Rolls and clips. Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for Rio Grande, 